this to me is kind of the nub of the issue. It is true that the President's budget is stabilizing the debt. That is, that you're bringing down the deficits in a way that the debt as a share of the gross domestic product does not continue to increase. The problem that I see is it is stabilized at a level that is too high. That is, stabilized at a level of over gross debt of over 100 percent of GDP. Uh, I go back to the Reinhardt Rogoff study, 200 years of financial history, 44 countries. Their conclusion, when you have a gross debt of over 90 percent of GDP, future economic growth is diminished, and pretty significantly. Have you assessed the Reinhardt Rogoff study? Do you agree with it? Do you think that they are correct in terms of high levels of debt f affecting future economic growth adversely? Absolutely. And it's an excellent study. And you could say in some ways what you summarize from it understates the risks because it's not just that governments or countries that live with very high debt to GDP ratios are consigned to weaker growth. They're consigned to uh, the damage that comes from periodic financial crises as well. Now, could you put that chart back up there for yeah. a sec? Um, I think that, let me just say two things about this. At, at, in some ways, that, that overstates the near-term problem because, uh, as, as you know, we hold substantial financial assets, and you really want to look at debt net of financial assets, and you want to look at debt held by the public. Uh, but in many ways, that still understates the problem because that does not capture the future liabilities that are embedded in Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, which, of course, grow at a very rapid pace in the decades beyond that. So if you're going to look at a true measure today of our full obligations to our citizens, the commitments we've made, of course, as you know better than anybody, it would be, it would be much, much higher than that. You know, that's <laughs> having served on the commission, having served here on the Budget Committee for 24 years, if there's one thing I am absolutely persuaded of, the risk to this country is untenable, absolutely untenable. So that takes me to the next if, if we've agreed that this is too high a level of debt, that this does compromise future economic growth, then the question is, how do we go beyond what the President has proposed? I give him credit for stabilizing the debt, but it's stabilized at a level that is too high. So, uh, and I'm not one that expected the President to lay out a, a detailed plan in his budget because I know how this town works. Had he done that, the other side then spends all their time lacerating the plan. The question is, how do we get to the table to have a serious negotiation between the House of Representatives, the United States Senate, the White House, what is, the, what is your vision of how in the coming days and weeks we find a way to get to the table for a serious negotiation? Uh, excellent question. I know you thought a lot about that and offered a lot of ideas on that. I, uh, I guess I would say that what we're going to see in the next few weeks is the following. Um, in the House, uh, the Republican leadership will have to propose and pass a budget resolution that lays out, like the President's budget does, a comprehensive plan, revenues and outlays, uh, to bring deficits down over the next 10 years. And they, in that context, will have to make the kind of choices we make in this budget, which is to answer the question, how far do you have to reduce the deficits? How far do you have to go? How deep do you have to go? How uh, quickly or how gradually should you get there? What should be the composition of tax changes and reductions in spending to achieve that objective? What are you doing about things that matter to how we grow as a country in the future? So they'll, they'll lay out those basic fundamental choices. Now there's a process in the Senate uh, that is engaged in looking at uh, a, a way to adapt uh, the kind of comprehensive framework you saw in the Commission and see if you can translate that into consensus here. That, when it, when it comes, will provide a, a, another contrasting vision about strategy. And then you'll have a chance at that point for people to confront 
the tough choices you have to make in choosing among those basic paths. And I, again, I think it's important to recognize that uh, this, the President's budget does not solve all the problems facing the country. It's not a budget for the next century. What it does do is tell you how to get to a level over the next 10 years that leaves us with a level of debt as a share of the economy that is probably stable and it would not weaken future growth. But of course, it doesn't solve the questions beyond that. And if, if uh, the Congress finds the will to go deeper, lower deficits over that 10 year period of time, which as you said would be desirable because it would start to bring the debt to GDP on a downward path, then like the commission did, the commission achieved that, uh, then people will say, will be able to look at it and they'll say, um, are we prepared to make the choice necessary to go beyond that? And I think, again, the fundamental reality that I think we all have to confront, and it's both the executive and the Congress, is that the current process we use for making these choices does not work. It has not worked. It's completely dysfunctional, in part because it leaves us with year by year incremental uncertainty creating changes to taxes with no clarity on spending. And the reason why Rogar Reiner produced the study that shows this effect on growth, opportunity incomes from high deficits, is because you leave the American people and American businesses to deal with a deeply uncertain future about what's going to happen to things that deeply affect their income and their business prospects. So the costs of leaving that uncertainty out there are very, very high. And to resolve that, you need something beyond a year-by-year -year, uh, political fight on incremental change. You need something that locks in comprehensive multi-year reductions. That way, people can look at it and they can plan. They say, OK, I know what's going to happen now. I know how Congress is going to solve the problem, and I can plan and adjust and prepare for those changes. Well, let me take you right to, because my time has almost expired. Let me just take you right to the commission. Because we did get 11 of 18 to agree, five Democrats, five Republicans, one independent. And we reduced the debt $4 trillion over the next 10 years, $4 trillion. The president said about a trillion. Uh, not only did we stabilize the debt, we started bringing it down as a share of GDP and over time brought it down markedly uh, to a place where you'd not only be, you'd, you'd be guarding against, you'd be hedging against future economic risk. Is the size of what the commission recommended a package that you believe would make sense, that is $4 trillion of debt reduction, if we could get it on a bipartisan basis? Uh, I think you slightly overachieved in terms of what's necessary. But again, our, our risk, of course, as a country is we do too little, not too much at the moment. So I admire you for laying out that, that set of paths. But um, what... So if, if four trillion is overshooting, what, what do you think? Three trillion? Uh, again, I think the minimum test is to get the deficits comfortably below 3% of GDP for a sustained period of time. Now, again, the, as you know, the basic... But that, doesn't, but, but that doesn't reduce the debt. I mean, that'll right. just... But if you... That'll just keep it from growing. You, you have to get them there soon enough that you stop the debt from growing as a share of the economy at an acceptable level. But again, there's, there's a... Again, I admire you for, for, going, for going further, and if we can do that, that would be excellent. But the, what is driving, you know, the 10-year deficits is not Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. What's driving the 10-year deficits are just a gap between resources and commitments outside those basic programs. It's beyond the 10-year window where you start to see those commitments, you know, eat a excessively large share of GDP. And so what really matters, if you, if you want to go d deeper than 3% of GDP, is what do you lock in for those entitlement programs outside that 10-year budget window? Oh. Could, I, could I say one more thing, Mr. Chairman? If you, yeah. There's a chart on there, thing I'd like you to put back up, which shows outlays and revenues to GDP, because I think that's the right way to think about it. Oh, if they're gone, then I won't, I won't do it. But uh, yeah, what the President's budget does is to uh, propose some changes in revenues that would leave revenues as a share of GDP slightly above the historic average. I think in the President's budget, they, they rise to a little bit below 20 percent of GDP, a little bit less than what the Commission proposed. And outlays in the President's budget minus interest fall to around 20. Interest is about 3% of GDP at the end of that period if you do that. Uh, so the reason I say that is because 
when you think about the, ch the choices we face, they're about, like, what do you want government to do? How large a share of income do you want the government to take and spend? And what the President's budget do does is get you in a point where revenues are not high at a level that would threaten future growth, and outlays minus interest, which is just the cost of the acc accumulated mistakes of the past, are at a level that is really quite low in historical period. You know, I said 20 percent of GDP <coughs> minus interest, and of course the discretionary non-defense share is much, much lower as a share of GDP at the end of that 10-year window. Uh, you know, I'd like to continue the discussion. My time's expired, so we'll go to Senator Sessions, but I'd like to, if we have a chance to get to a second round, come back to this point.